get into fuels for fuel cells. And we've mentioned them, but I'd like to hand, hand you a, a look at kind of the extreme differences. Here's solid fuels. These are solid metal fuels, aluminum fuels for a type of fuel cell, aluminum air. And this is gaseous hydrogen, the other extreme. You know, this is about the extreme run of differences in properties. This is a very low density fuel. This is a very high density fuel. This is a fuel that needs containment. This one you can carry around in your pocket for a while and clean up and put it in your fuel cell and run until you've expended it. This one actually has the energy density of liquid gasoline. This one has the electric, the electric energy density of the heating energy <coughs> density of gasoline. Pressure the gas. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's correct. The, the issue. Oh, yeah, liquid gas. Huh? Yeah. The issue in terms of uh, conversion then becomes, or conversion efficiency becomes, how much energy does it take to make the aluminum out of aluminum oxide or whatever you have when you're done with the reaction, maybe aluminum chloride? And how much do you get out of it? How much does it take to get it out? That's right. How much does it take to get out of it? Yeah, but the point is that it, it, it takes more energy to make the aluminum for aluminum air, but it's a very nice portable force of energy. What's a throwaway then? How do you use them? Well, no, you could recover the uh, ingredients. You could re recover the aluminum oxide that's produced. And then sell that and get another one? Um, and, and, and put it in an electrolyzer, another type of electrolyzer than we've been explaining. Recover the aluminum. You can run a aluminum oxide to aluminum electrolysis cell and recover the aluminum. So you well, it's it's just the the reason that it's a, a dense medium is that aluminum would like to be aluminum oxide. And the reason it isn't becoming aluminum oxide in this room is because of one reason. It can't gain the activation energy to do so through the oxide. It can't continue to run the process through its oxide. The oxide stops it. If you interrupt that oxide, that aluminum will oxidize rapidly, heat up. You can run a cell that I'm going to describe presently that is a very efficient cell for producing hydrogen. If you take an aluminum wire and feed it into a supply of water, and bias the area of contact with an electric potential, if you make this go through a gland that you apply a voltage to, such an arc welder, <laughs> that's right. You can, you can make hydrogen as you make aluminum oxide. In fact, You're just melting the aluminum. Well, what the reaction is... So you need water solution to the ground as well? Well, anyway, you, you complete the circuit and you produce this reaction. And the function of the applied voltage is to keep the oxide from stopping the reaction. If you make this if you make this a, a reaction to completion, it wants to make Al2O3. But you can also make hydroxide, aluminum hydroxide, or one of the sub-hydroxides by applying the voltage. So depending on the voltage applied, you can control the rate of hydrogen production. And the amount of voltage that you apply to this is far beneath, far less, and certainly the current that you carry to continue this reaction is far less than the electrolysis of water. So do you, do we, do you, does water need to be 
put some a uh, base in it or something, or just straight DI water? Well, sure. The water reduces the voltage across it by making if it's more conductive. So you would tend to want to make this more conductive. So drop in some caustic soda. Caustic soda, salt water, either one. You could run either as a. Uh, What's the voltage source you said in the range of? Oh, a couple volts. So car battery, arc welder. Adequate. The water's going to get hot, though. Well, the water will get hot. The hotter it runs, the hotter that water gets, the faster it'll run. So just straight standard aluminum water, a little conducting. Yep. But, but you do not have to run the voltage continuously. You can run this through a circuit that makes a low duty cycle on the voltage application. So a low duty cycle pulse? Low duty cycle pulse. Maybe a 5% in time if the frequency is high enough. In other words, out of a given second, you might have, um, out, of, out of a second, you'd have 1,000 um, milliseconds. You might run uh, 50 milliseconds of voltage application. The purpose of the voltage is to interrupt the oxide, the Al203, so the water can get to it. If you do that, this reaction will run and then it'll start developing oxide and then it'll run again after you deoxidize it, after you deflake it. Sure, steam will work, work great. <clears throat> but it's interesting, you know, in the, in the scheme of things, that if you want to make hydrogen, you can take virtually any of the metals that's listed in your chart iron included, react them with water. And the higher the temperature of the reaction, the faster that will go and release hydrogen. What key use of iron for this, for the same experiment? Yeah, absolutely. But aluminum works better? Well, aluminum is a, um, yes, it does. Zinc? The answer is, yeah, zinc will work. Any of these metals that are listed below hydrogen in that uh, series will work. We'll do it fine. You can also gas, hydrogen. A hydrogen enriched gas. Yep. It's a it's a way to produce hydrogen quickly in high purity. How about the byproducts that are in the air? No byproducts in the air, you just have things in the water. So everything goes in the water that except the hydrogen coming in the air. That's right. Okay, so why isn't this this pop can, which has, why isn't this turning into, it seems like aluminum water doesn't want to react that. That's why you have to interrupt the oxide on it that's protecting it. So the oxide forms ruled iron quick on the surface of aluminum and the, and the electrolysis is taking it away. That's right. And this is room temperature water that we can start this with? You can run it at room temperature. Uh, run it faster at higher temperatures. So when you reverse the current on it, you drive the oxide? What you're doing is actually breaking the oxide. That's the, per the, the purpose is to cause that oxide to spall off. So I don't need to clean it up with any HCL or steel wool or anything first. The electrolysis will take care of any of the surface oxide just from sitting out in the and run the, other, run the positive side of the battery over to the water. You well, can do the same. If you've got multiple like, well, if you're doing this, you're going to have to, well, you're going to have another metal on the water for the other electrode. Oh, well, it depends on how you do it. If this is a um, metal that's picked so that it doesn't go into solution and doesn't participate in that reaction, it'll stay. Uh, well, it might, you'll have to watch the voltages, but anything above hydrogen won't go in. Nickel won't. Well, copper shouldn't either. Copper shouldn't. You, you, you get copper in for another reaction, but... but throw, throw the copper wire back into the pods. Put it into a plastic pod, throw the copper wire back into the pod. That's true. Put the aluminum in. You, you could. The, the point I want to make is that there are unpracticed economies in the metallurgy uh, industry, such as making iron at a higher overall fuel efficiency, if you choose to use it as a fuel, than making electricity. You can still make iron or steel at a higher efficiency than you make electricity in the common Rankine cycle power plant.
The question always becomes then, what about transportation costs of a heavy metal, steel, to a user to run such a reaction? So you, you do incur transportation costs. And those costs are higher than putting hydrogen in a pipeline and delivering to the customer the hydrogen directly. Then you rationalize the question, well, why do we waste the coal to produce the iron to produce the hydrogen? Why don't we go to solar or wind and make the direct production and take the advantage of pipeline delivery? And, and again, you get around to the realization that you're always ahead by cutting down the number of steps between you and the finish line. If you can make hydrogen directly at any of the renewable resources that are in abundance, at the site of where they're more in, in, in greatest abundance, Delivered by pipeline, you'll beat every other technique. You can ship hydrogen across the country, across the oceans, much less expensively in terms of materials involved and energy utilized than you can ship electricity. What do you have to do to the existing natural gas pipelines to ship hydrogen? Well, it's, it's a point of great debate, but I can tell you my personal experience. I used to teach that they wouldn't work because they would be embrittled by hydrogen. But since then, I've run a lot of experiments, and here's what I found. You can, you can go into the general population of hydrogen cylinders, like we're going to look at closely pretty quick, and you'll find in that inventory lots of old cylinders. I have a 1916 and a 1917. These old cylinders prove that steel is compatible with diatomic hydrogen. They were working 20 years before the Hindenburg burned. They were in the field 20 years before the Hindenburg burned. And they've been faithfully bouncing off of trucks and going into welding shops ever since. That steel isn't as high in quality control, isn't as highly qualified as modern steels for pipelines. When you have hydrogen embrittlement in a, mar in a modern park pipeline, well, you can always <clears throat> be sure that it was because hydrogen entered into a weldment or some other aspect of the construction, some other area of the construction, in an atomic or ionic state. The, the way you can make sure you do get embrittlement is go to the plating house, put on the conditions for plating a metal that makes hydrogen bubble. If the hydrogen is bubbling, it starts as a ion, becomes an atom, both of which are point blank exposed to the metal, before it becomes diatomic hydrogen, before it gets to be bigger by joining more atoms of hydrogen. It's, it's always going to be available to the lattice and available to enter the lattice as an, as an ion or, a diatomic, or as atomic hydrogen, rather. In that condition, you can embrittle almost anything. The hydrogen will enter the lattice. It'll stay parked there for a while, start making atomic out of ionic and diatomic out of atomic until it grows and produces internal pressure and makes the metal behave in a brittle fashion. But if you also do what the plating house does, and that is to bake the hydrogen out, then you're safe. Right after plating, a good operation, a good plating house, will immediately bake out as a procedure. They'll put it in an oven and hold it for a while, bake out any hydrogen, after which they have great success with the ductility of the metal and of the plating, of the adherence of the plating. My point is this. Based on real, real world experience, we can hold hydrogen in steel pipelines without question, and indefinitely long. So long as the welders are, are advised to not use wet rod, so they don't introduce water under an arc, which would make it into atomic and ionic hydrogen. Number two, if they, if they think they have hydrogen in a weldment, they should bake it. They should get a torch on and hold it at baking temperatures until it's gone. Three, where they think they have ionizing potential as in corrosion from galvanic or ground loops that use their system as a path, they must cancel that ionic 
ion producing or that ionizing voltage with a ground, an adequate ground, and if necessary with a controlled application of voltage to make it null. If you do those things, the existing pipelines are adi absolutely adequate. But we don't know how those were welded, right? Well, here's the thing. Pipelines embrittle every day on natural gas. You know, we, we find hydrogen embrittlement lots of times, less today than, than when I first started taking notice of it. But you can trace it. You can absolutely know that you can trace it to the conditions under which they were, in which they were welded or which they were originally produced. Wherever it occurs, and it isn't going to be every time, you just go in and replace whatever's embrittled and bake. You know, if you think you have a condition that's a incipient failure, you come in and bake it out. The baking temperatures are moderate. They can be 250 degrees if you hold them for a while. At 300 degrees, it's less time required. At 350, it's even less. And these are, these are exponential, as it turns out, in terms of hydrogen diffusion out of metal lattice. The other point is this, and I think that it's, it's equally important. The reason that the people that say embrittlement is a deal stopper usually do so for vested interests. They want contracts to replace a bunch of pipeline. They want the public to somehow pay through governmental agencies for private pipelines. Almost every time that you see somebody raising a ruckus about hydrogen embrittlement, they've also got a proposal almost done to replace the pipeline. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, I noticed that correlation. Please. Being in the uh, gas utility business and operating pipelines uh, all the way up to 650 PSIG, uh, I, I have a problem with transporting hydrogen. One, on the lower end, we typically use polyethylenes. And I'm not sure exactly what the, uh, I don't know if they call it diffusivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but you may have some migrating through the walls of the pipe on the plastic side. And then the other concerns I have is with copper and brasses that are in a regulators and uh, throughout, not so much with the steel, especially if it's, uh, you know, if it's a carbon steel, uh, we don't really see a major problem. Jerry brings up some, some very practical issues. Pipelines turn out to be an ensemble of a whole lot of different materials and typically of a whole lot of different ages and styles of installation, designs on the installation. They also turn out to, to actually be the ground for many electrical uh, stray currents. When you wish they weren't, they too often turn out to be. And and in, in places, they are intermixed. Usually it's terminal, but sometimes they're intermixed with non-conductors. You, you, know, you have a, a string of conductor, conductive steel, then you have a, a high pressure polymer for some reason. And then it goes to a uh, pressure drop and then it goes through a final distribution of low pressure polymer. The question is, in high pressure, for instance, are you going to have more hydrogen loss by diffusion? Is the diffusivity going to be high enough to cause a major loss? Will the loss lead to danger? Well, yeah, will people be exposed? And, and incidentally, if you introduce a new factor, won't lawyers just flock to it no matter what? <laughs> well, I threw that in. <laughs> but it's real. The point is this, and the, and the answer is this. We absolutely need to carry on some tests that have been very successful where companies wanted to take advantage of hydrogen that was going to waste. They got it into the natural gas stream and it's been in the mains for a long time. There are, there are gas companies that have very successfully recovered waste hydrogen and put it in with natural gas. And there are other companies that have blindly, for years on end, shipped naturally occurring hydrogen, natural gas that had hydrogen in it, without knowledge of the fact that it was high in hydrogen. There are natural gas wells that are 
but are producing, in some instances, predominant amounts of hydrogen for their BTU content. They produce more hydrogen BTUs than they produce methane BTUs or ethane BTUs or any other hydrocarbon BTUs. So it's been in the mains for a long time. The in company there at Amarillo got into the business of set up a big methane plant to strip uh, helium and hydrogen out of their natural gas water. Yeah. Pickens got into the business of converting vehicles to natural gas operations from that, I mean, yeah, natural gas and hydrogen. And and that gets shipped down in a common pipeline. We have had some failures and I've had some house fires as a result of the flex connectors failing. They were primarily produced around 1960 to 1968. And it was the method of construction where they had a brass connector on the end of it, and then the flex connector had some solder material. Yeah. And the type of failure we've seen was it was not a ductile failure, it was a brittle failure. And I, I suspect that it has to do with either the H2S that may be in the line or some hydrogen that was introduced to give us the brittle failures. H2S is absolutely a problem wherever it occurs. H2S sets up acids, by itself it's corrosive. H2S is, is a major, major issue where it occurs. If there's anything you can do to diminish H2S in any of our fuel systems, it's, it's worthwhile doing. In fact, sulfur turns out to be a spoiler for the coal and oil and natural gas industry and for the hydrogen industry. It poisons catalysts. If you want to kill a fuel cell, absolutely a sure way to do it, almost any of them, is with H2S because it deposits sulfur. Sulfur turns out to be sufficiently inert to be a long-term poison and it's hard to get rid of once deposited. You, you know, you can't get off the shelf something to go get it. It's there, it's going to live with you until you tear the thing down. The, the other main problem that Jerry brought up was dissimilar materials. You have lead, copper, and the ingredients, and the brass, and the ingredients that are also unknown ingredients that they may have also used that, that come into play again and again in thread compounds and whatnot. So set up a, a uh, corrosion cell. Yeah. Brittle failure in these, in these types of galvanic cells is, is, is going to happen anywhere that there's one more ingredient we haven't mentioned, and that's moisture. All you have to have is that dissimilar combination and moisture, and you'll get the failure. It's a matter of time. There's another type that is from the outside in failure that is due to household cleansers that, that find those flex couplings, particularly the chlorides. But in any event, that loss of material, particularly from the grain boundaries, does depend on moisture. But you can almost take that as a given. Natural gas has moisture. I, w I would repeat, though, and it's a very important thing. If you're going to be in the fuel business, and you know the topic right now is fuel, you have to deal with sulfur. You have to find a way to filter, eliminate sulfur. Sulfur comes from a lot of sources. You, can, you know, there's amazing chemistry, some of which is man intended. We put sulfur in natural gas in the form of thio compounds. We put mercaptan on purpose in gas. Over a long term period, you can expect that to either go through to the burner tip or for some reason be accumulated in a system. Hopefully, it gets through to the burner tip. Sometimes it doesn't, it winds up being concentrated by the materials of construction. The other comment that he made that was really important was, what about loss of hydrogen because it's the littlest molecule? Hydrogen is the littlest molecule in, in terms of the common molecules, but diatomic hydrogen isn't as small as helium. If you want to make a test to see what's going to happen just on size of particle, helium is your test. Compared to diatomic hydrogen, it's, it's quite small. The 
issue here though is to compare with natural gas which is big compared to hydrogen you have a big carbon and four hydrogens compared to two hydrogens and so any time that you're going to leak hydrogen will be a greater leak it'll leak at a higher rate but in energy units it turns out for the same size orifice or the same size crack there's not much difference between the energy lost in a hydrogen passage through that leak than natural gas passage through that leak and if you want to leak a lot of energy ethane leaks more than the rest of the constituents or, or propane leaks more than the rest of the constituents that are common constituents because it carries more energy per quantity or unit volume but to the question of polymers and, and this is practical this point of discussion right now you can go down and buy from Lincoln composite a polymer lined high pressure hydrogen storage tank Lincoln uses a, an injection blow molded liner upon which they wrap to develop the strength and they have done so with junctions between the polymer and steel or aluminum depends on which model you order so they have a, a leak proof system that you can't find the leaks you can't detect leaks with modern leak detectors in those tanks I'm not saying that all the pipeline is as good as what they're doing but it sure speaks favorably of polymers of polyolefins there are two that are that are used one is uh, injection molded polyethylene and the other is injection molded polypropylene both have been very successful in containment of helium of hydrogen of natural gas at uh, 3600 psi the point is that that's much higher in pressure and therefore in the pressure field that's available to force a leak or diffusion than in 650 or 700 psi natural gas delivery but again I would I would be the first to say that in spite of the field tests that show that you can send hydrogen interchangeably or intermingled with natural gas you need to make a specific test on specific systems before you turn it loose the the greatest detriment isn't the leakage the greatest detriment to hydrogen in the pipeline is that it has lower heating value per unit of volume a cubic foot of hydrogen wants to deliver 325 BTUs instead of 950 BTUs minimum for natural gas that's the critical difference to the to the industry it means that the capacity of the pipeline is about a third what it was before to the guy at the pumping station it means that he's going to put more pumping energy into the moving it to market those are the two very realistic objections in comparison and and this is right on the topic of fuels for the fuel cell in comparison if you're going to ship a really long distance you want to up the pressure of the system to two or three times the, the current pressures and and do so with a type of pressurization that is electrolysis Jack why would we want to use electrolysis for pressurization why would you want to do it probably you could do it locally you could do it locally and you can do it without a lot of moving parts you can you can much more efficiently take water through electrolysis and make pressure than you can take a compressor and produce pressure on gaseous hydrogen or helium or nitrogen or anything else but in the case of hydrogen it's a it's a major opportunity to go from liquid water to 1800 times that volume in the oxygen and hydrogen produced if you electrolyze water of one cubic foot you get 1800 cubic feet of gases if you constrain those gases from expanding to 1800 cubic feet you can pressurize to a very high number much higher than the per current uh, pipeline or or pressure storage numbers if you needed to produce 100,000 psi you can produce it by running a current through water 
or water that's been made is a sufficient electrolyte by addition of uh, potassium hydroxide or sulfuric acid or bicarbonate of soda or, or something else that you've selected. This is a major opportunity for making a savings compared to compressing natural gas or landfill gas. It's also the technology for producing locally. If you have in abundance something of a renewable electricity supply locally, it's very good to incur the losses on the grid, deliver the electricity, electrolyze the water, store it. If you want to transport it a great distance, increase the pressure of, of transmission, and you get a, a very favorable economic analysis out of the use of the renewable, the, the original electricity. You, you, can, you have all the options that you need. You can store it for a more profit-producing market. You can deliver it to a city dweller who doesn't have any other chance at renewable electricity or hydrogen, and do so with um, wheeling through an existing infrastructure or by wheeling through an existing infrastructure. Those are very favorable directions for us to go. I think that there's a, there's a feature that can't be emphasized enough, and that is the, so far as fuel is concerned, and that is the desirability of having a reversible fuel cell so that you can immediately get back into electricity or after a long time of waiting uh, with equal ease and a relatively high efficiency. If you've, if you've made that step of going into hydrogen, you'll have the highest efficiency in, in terms of fuel cell efficiency that's available. Even if you choose to run your phosphoric acid on hydrogen, it'll have a higher efficiency per BTU input than you would have on natural gas. Phosphoric acid is reversible just like the original sulfuric acid. It is. Can be. It is yeah. Yeah, you can set up the, uh, you, you can set up any of the temperature range machines for reversible operation. You can even run a, a reversible zirconia membrane system to produce from steam hydrogen and oxygen. From steam. Has this always been known? Was, was Not much. Factor? Oh, Nernst, the, Nernst knew it. Walter Nernst, Nernst rather, knew this. But it seems to have been lost on a lot of... Well, what did it say? It goes steam again? You can run steam into a thousand degree fuel cell, apply voltage, dissociate the steam into hydrogen and oxygen, diffuse the oxygen the opposite direction as it runs in the fuel cell, and have hydrogen in enrichment on the other electrode. As long as you got the energy in the first place. Sure. Use uh, some waste resource to make the steam. Absolutely. Well, solar uh, troughs or dishes make steam quite easily. They make this temperature easily. So what would a box look like that you, know, you would feed the steam into to electrolyze? The, um, well, let's take a trough And um, you know, as an example, you'd you'd put at the at the target at the target you'd run water until it was high temperature steam. At the other end, or we'll run it from there to here, but here it comes as high temperature steam. You add this, and I'm you'd ordinarily want to do this in cylindrical design, but I'll do it in planar design instead. So you'd add this to a cell and it's at a thousand degrees C. You now apply a voltage. You diffuse the oxygen. Yeah. You, you apply the voltage and now you diffuse the oxygen through that membrane to get it away from the hydrogen. 
So out here you have oxygen, and out here you have hydrogen. The advantage of which is, and this is, this is really important, the advantage of which is that the efficiency of this operation electrically can be over 100% because you've substituted heat for voltage. You didn't get something for nothing. You didn't violate any of the laws of thermodynamics, but you can certainly get more BTUs of hydrogen out of this unit than you put in equivalent units of electricity by virtue have, of having added the solar energy. Now you can take this hydrogen that you've produced and actually run a fuel cell that provides the electricity for this machine and have electricity left over. But, but remember, what you're doing is trading off the capital investment of, of this machine to collect renewable energy and amortizing the on-the-ground investment you know, the rest of the on-the-ground on investment over its life, but this is a very good deal thermodynamically. So you can, you can run a, a process that is very high in efficiency. I'll say, electrically speaking, you can do 100% or more, deliver the hydrogen to a 50% electrolyzer, and be way ahead in a, in a sustainable regime for capturing from outer space, something that we add to the inventory of what we work with in a wealth addition manner. How do you um, separate the oxygen from the hydrogen? Well, you, what, what happens at the electrode is this. I'm going to blow up a piece of this. Uh -huh. And uh, what happens at this electrode is that we have hydrogen that lays on the electrode, but it's hot, and when it hits, what we, what we do is to separate it. We take the oxygen off, we, we make it go as a ion into solution. It goes into the system as an ion. We let the hydrogen come together as H2, and it goes out. On the other side, we give back the electron and produce oxygen. We run a, a forced delivery of electrons to where we want the oxygen to take it after stripping it to release the hydrogen. The voltage doesn't turn out to be 1.4 volts to do this. The voltage goes down as the temperature goes up. So we can get below the voltage of the fuel cell that is the room temperature fuel cell. In between there, you can do one of Jerry's deals. You can take all the heat that's being delivered here and put it somewhere of value. You can put it into a heat engine or you can put it in a countercurrent heat exchanger to preheat the steam that you want to make do a lot of energy recovery with it, which is very beneficial in the overall analysis. But for sure, you can run this at below the voltage of a room temperature fuel cell. Way below. And the, and the benefit to doing so is you're taking something from outer space, adding it to what you can control on the ground. Well, the catalysts in this, in this case are still, on this side, having to resist the oxidation and temperature. So these typically are very high temperature semiconductors made, for instance, of silicon carbide. So this is a high temperature fuel cell. Yeah, this, is a, <clears throat> yeah, this, is a, this little number right up here is 1,000 C, or thereabouts, 800 degrees C to 1,200 degrees C. So the catalyst for this system is very important. It doesn't have to be the, have the activity of a room temperature catalyst, but it has to be very stable, and it has to host this, this type of presentation of the molecule. You want to get that oxygen somehow brought into close proximity to that zirconia, or something that will exchange to zirconia with a minimum ohmic loss. 
the, 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 you're absorbing the hydrogen here, you're producing oxygen, and you're producing electricity. Not, we're not absorbing the hydrogen anymore. We're, we're letting that hydrogen get out of there as a gas. They come together. They come off of, they're coming in this direction. The oxygen is entering as an ion into a... Which is a reversible deal? Absolutely. When the sun goes down, you put it back together. That's right. Absolutely. Or you can take it to market. If, you know, if the market's ready, you, or if you want to put it in storage and wait until you don't have sunshiny days, you can. Well, I'm thinking of a remote home production, small scale or something like that. How, how expensive? I mean, the solar part of the thing is not that big a deal. It looks like a real good way to reduce the cost on the fuel cell. Absolutely. It, Oh, well, here's how. Here, here's the answer. I mean, this is, that is that's a very good question. If, if your system, well, yeah, but if your system is assuming that you're going to run that immediate time frame of, of nighttime, you just insulate it. You just make this a thermal capacity that's adequate to run a long time with no other input. And there are losses. If you're applying enough EMF on here, you'll produce losses. Those losses, you have a choice. You either remove them or leave them in. If you leave them in, you're ahead for the uh, temperature. You know, you, you can either make a uh, temperature rise out of it or choose to taper it off, depending on how your uh, accountant um, judges the value of BTUs. Losses coming back. So That's right. Back to water. That's right. You have many choices. Let me just get through the choices. You can burn some hydrogen and make heat. You have that in storage. You can consume some electricity off of your fuel cell if the market isn't that valuable for it. And you can spend some money with insulation so you just retain heat. The other proposition in this regard is that if you don't want to go that high in temperature, you can go to red hot temperatures. This is white hot temperatures. You can go to red hot temperatures and run an iron reaction. You can run steam with iron and produce hydrogen. And then recover the iron, illustratively, by electrolysis out of a fused salt electrolyte or out of other um, process chemistry that gives you back iron out of iron oxide. Well, it's a lot of steps, and it and it you know it involves more capital equipment. It's a, it's totally you have to be a little steel maker. You know, you have to decide to be everything that a steel maker is. You have to take um, iron oxide back to iron. This is what HR we're going to do the main That is true. That is true. But I mention it because it has historical import not only with H power, but in production of steel itself. Would, would this not enhance the phosphoric acid unit? You, putting, hot, putting steam in there? Than that from you've got to watch Walter. He's going to get in your uh, thermodynamic regime here. <laughs> what Walter's proposed is a way to cascade the heat out of a hot electrolyzer to a medium temperature electrolyzer to a cool electrolyzer. It's a very good thing to do. The more times that you can make that heat work for you, the better. It, it may or may not suit your load to do that, depending on how it comes. Does your load mostly come in the daytime or mostly come at night? Straight flat. On, on what I was looking at, the Steam flaker basically run 24 hours. <laughs> well, in Walter's case, it would probably be of great benefit to run hot all the time, just one unit, and spend some hydrogen if you ever had to fight excessive cooling, and, and just burn it, just make it hot. You can always burn some of the hydrogen and add it to the steam to bring up that temperature. The other thing I can do, I can burn manure. Or you could, that's right, you can absolutely, any, any, source of, any source of heat release in that, sure, any source of heat release in that process is, yeah, 
most of the third, that's true. Most of the third world is running on wood or dung. You know, they've, they've by and large out of necessity stripped the wood, now they're looking at dung. Or, or anything that, sure. The, the point though is that any source of heat for that process that is coming to you free is valuable. So how much would it cost to build a unit like that? I mean, to do the steam, steam electrolyzing? Can you buy that sort of thing off the shelf or can you build it? Well, there was a company that was headed to market called Westinghouse, but they have been sold. They, you know, And now you'd have to talk to a completely new cast of characters to find out. But they were coming with tubular design of zirconia tubes that could serve as a high temperature medium for ion transport. The ions could be lots of different ones, but they were setting up for oxygen. That would facilitate, that technology was good because it would facilitate this type of, of system especially, and you know, I, I emphasize the especially, with high pressure benefits. You can, out of tubular construction or, or circular section, stand a lot of pressure. So you're, you're greatly benefited on this end of the pipeline by putting a pump for the liquid, making whatever pressure you wanted to deliver the hydrogen, and having no gas to pump. I feel like the guys in the 1960s sitting around talking about semiconductor technology. It's about, <laughs> well, it's about the same. It's about the same. The, the idea in this regard, you want to use a very thin layer of zirconia. Thin from the standpoint of still separating the gas, the molecules and the atoms, but allowing the ions only to pass still being very dielectric, very resistant to the flow of electrons. And that can be put on a lot of different uh, supporting systems. That can be put on silicon carbide, can be put on um, transition systems where you put a layer of silicon carbide and a layer of metal such as molybdenum, one of the refractory metals, and finish with zirconia. Aren't, aren't some of these computer makers, chip makers or something, don't they have technology already in place that they can just venture off and do these without spending millions and millions in, in tooling up? I mean, they do just about everything imaginable on the wafer. Well, I, I think looks that... It's like, to me, I mean, just in years of my mind, it looks like they'd almost have in place the technology to do something. The marketplace doesn't respond to a zirconia tube like they respond to a television or a radio. Do you know how much how many dollars in pentium tubes go into one silicon wafer? In comparison, they get a lot more markup out of building a uh, 486 for their amount of material and the amount of energy they put in than they would get out of this device. Granted, the public isn't supporting that device. And you don't see any cheaper material that that's made out of? Oh, I do. Some type of doped. Or something. Well, no, you'd look more likely at doped alumina. Doped alumina. And doped titanium dioxide, TiO2. Yeah, doped with paint. Well, <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> but, but <laughs> that's right on the beam with respect to what you want to do. You want to take a manufacturing process like that can. They produce that can at 60 a second and put it through a, a, a heavy anodize, such as just putting it in a, a sulfuric acid bath and putting a polarity on it for oxidizing or in a phosphoric acid bath. But that's what you'd do. You'd take a, a process that would produce really good economy of scale turn it into a finished product that would take the temperature, such as alumina, AL203, perhaps doped with one of the, a small amount of one of the uh, rare earth uh, elements, and, and do the job out of more common materials than zirconia. Looks like that's where we all be heading our efforts instead of... 
Well, there are a number of materials that are pretty surprising if you go up a little bit more in temperature, alumina is being one of them, is, is starting to have pretty good conductivity for oxygen. So it is an, an area that has great prospects for improvement and great prospects for ultimately coming in a class of materials that everybody in the world could afford to have some. So this is aluminum or aluminum oxide? Oh, what is it that you're holding up? The top of the pop Oh, well, any piece of aluminum you touch on the surface is aluminum oxide, but in, inside of that one is aluminum. So as soon as I take this and this and walk outside to the cell with the sodium hydroxide, with the um, baking soda in it, I want you to convert this into H2. Yeah, you could get some H2 off of it with a common battery. Well, so it's classic. Yeah. <laughs> here's what else you can do. Here's, here's what else you can do. You can trace the, the hull process for making aluminum by electrolysis. And if you put in solar energy to make the temperature a high temperature process, you can dramatically improve the energy used to value received in energy units of the electrolysis of aluminum out of bauxite. Let me say this more clearly. You can do the same thing for making aluminum that you do for yourself here in making hydrogen from water. Elevating the temperature is very beneficial. That with our Absolutely. Instead of going to the engine, why don't we? I agree. Uh, you know, the, the point of these comments regarding fuel is that these high temperature processes where the temperature is produced by solar energy are extremely valuable. This is the thermodynamics that you want to follow. These are, these are really the way that you get ahead in thermodynamics is by using something from outer space, solar energy. And something that's cheap. And something that's cheap. Would that be a better way than, than, than produce the hydrogen directly that way and then put it through a fuel cell? Sure, absolutely. Or put it through a Rather gas than turbine. Electricity and then go through electrolyzer? Absolutely. Well, here's the deal. Once you have that metal, it's, it's clear enough that it's compact as an energy storage unit, whether it's iron or magnesium or sodium or whatever. Those are all good routes. Let me quickly get into another one. Let me, let me, before we get out of here, I don't know if you guys want to break while it's all right with me, but I just want to quickly just make this door opener to you. If you, if you start looking at systems that are precursor to hydrogen release, then you get past the pure metals. You say, well, aluminum, iron, zinc, magnesium, lithium, sodium, and what have you. They're all interesting. But then you finally get into what would make more hydrogen. Well, it's hydrides of those metals. For instance, you can take sodium hydride. Sometimes. Yeah, stick with the good red one. Okay. It shows up nice and tight. The idea in this regard is that you can carry more hydrogen around if you add it to the metal that's also as a compound reactive with water. This, this is, a, is a pretty good thing to do. There are some systems that are, that are also quite good things to do, but this is a pretty good system to do because you get the hydrogen off and now you can take the sodium hydroxide, elevate the temperature of solar energy and react it with iron the input here being heat to, to follow that thermal chemistry, heat from the sun The, the, the proposition that you get to in this regard is that all of these need to be from the sun, whether it's heat, 
as the intermediate, or electricity as the intermediate, we need to adopt efficient solar energy conversion processes. We need to make large capital investment in such processes that are, are anti-inflationary to the issue of what's it do to the social fabric, it's not only anti-inflationary, produces a lot of jobs and a tremendous amount of satisfaction in saying we have used the best of the industrial revolution to make a, an economy that truly promises the opportunity for prosperity throughout society. Everybody gets a job if they want to work. Is that FEO or should that be something else? Well, it's, it's Depends on how you balance the equation, but it can be FEO, FE203, or FE304. Depends on the... I was using FE304. Among the... Oh, no, sorry. I was using FE203 when I did this earlier. Yeah, the way the, the, among the ways that iron will help you in this, it'll go from any of the valences to make... any available valence to make FEO, FE203, and FE304, depending on how you process it, how you select your temperatures and your environment. The point is... In, in round numbers, they're all going to give you about the same thing. You're going to recover the hydride as an output based on input of solar energy. You're going to recover all the hydride? Well, you can um, do it in degrees, but the answer is yes. But you're going to be continually producing an, an iron oxide. That's true. Just continue in the loop? Yeah, but you're going to be continually in that. Oxide, That's right. The way you the way you get back iron and oxygen is by electrolysis, high temperature electrolysis. Well, you put it in solution. You put the iron oxide in solution in a fused salt, a molten salt, such as one of the nitrite nitrate eutectics. There are fused salts that'll take iron into solution, iron oxide rather, into solution, from which you can apply a voltage, electrolyze it to, per, to, to get the iron out, just like you do with any other electrolysis or the aluminum we looked at before, and oxygen. But again, the, the chemistry that you want to run is thermally aided with energy from the sun. So long as you go to that advantage, you'll have anti-inflation as a result for the effort. So long as we stay dependent upon fossil energy, we'll be inflationary in our economy. Harder we work in the Industrial Revolution, so long as we make it dependent upon fossil, the worse our inflation is. Guaranteed problems. This solves a, a kind of important problem that I've been trying to deal with, and that's if you want to make electricity from solar right now, you're, really your only choice is photovoltaic panels. But the entire world output is only about 100 megawatts a year. We need gigawatts, so it's not going to happen with photovoltaic panels. So it sounds like what you've offered here is the only way to make solar electricity in a practical way in 10 or 20 years, enough solar electricity. We can absolutely apply the best of what we've learned to do in the Industrial Revolution, which is mass manufacturing, to these approaches. Because, I mean, it, it, it takes very little to make troughs and dishes. It's just glass and steel and aluminum. In fact, you can, you can absolutely say to the steel industry, we need just as much for this endeavor as the automotive industry needs. You can take 40 million tons a year. For them, it's good. They get jobs. How would this lend to recycling? <laughs> All the better. Yep. All the better. But my point is this. We have really done remarkably well with the Industrial Revolution in productivity. It's remarkable. Now we need to apply that to truly producing the goods and services on a sustainable basis. And, and by the way, most of what the Industrial Revolution has learned to do is applicable. Automotive type manufacturing fits this requirement. 
then what we really need to do is, is step into the technological revolution. Absolutely. We need to admit it. And, st and stop. And all of this stuff. Sure. We, we, need, we need to absolutely stop apologizing for the science fiction wrong turns that it might make and get on with making it make some right turns. And, and for heaven's sakes, say that our first business is making a profit about it. Nothing wrong with it. And, and by the way, on the way there, we should really make note that the harder we work at this renewable resources revolution, the less inflation we have to eat up savings. So savings become an incentive. Which is needed, because with savings you can get capital for good ideas. When Jerry says, I've got a, something to try, it'll be much more likely that someone will listen under those set of economic climate conditions than under the present ones. Hopping back for a few seconds, you could use, um, use a small fuel, you could use a fuel cell, aluminum, and water, and as long as you had a little bit of hydrogen to start the reaction, it would self-perpetuate until all the aluminum was oxidized away. So long, that's true, that is correct. And you could regenerate it so long as the sun shines. By a similar high temperature electrolysis process. Aluminum is readily recovered from its oxide by electrolysis. You have to use the molten salt as well? But that is, that is not beyond the Industrial Revolution. We produce it in giant quantity by that process today. I'm kind of behind it, but where does iron oxide reside mostly that you can put it back into the crust? Where do I have to go to replace it or whatever? Oh, well, you just keep it in captivity. You never run out of it. Whole system start with so much iron oxide and it never leaves you. That's right. Right down here along the Gila River is a tremendous deposit of iron oxide, black sand oxide. We have plenty of iron to do this job for everybody in the world. You always keep the iron in the oxygen, it gets away on you. That's about it. Huh? Well, the only thing that gets away comes back. Yeah, I know. The, <laughs> the only, <laughs> yeah, all right, this is big trouble. Well, but seriously, the scheme of things here is compatible with nature. The, the scheme of things here works with what we started with in a better way than what we're doing presently yeah. for, for profit-making purposes, for economic future planning purposes. Much better. If you're the czar of China, and you're worried about things they're really worried about, this is an answer. They're, they're so worried about too many people and too little food that they have armed guards at food depots. Indonesia. Indonesia. Around the world you're seeing more and more pressure for the simplest of what we take for granted in this economy. Food, shelter, but if you want to change that, if you want to change from having to glare at who is hungry, get to work making renewable resources. You know, it, this is a clear outcome. Everybody that's involved gets better off. Right now, <clears throat> the, the solution has been to do make work programs. But they all remain dependent on fossil energy. Make work programs around fossil energy are a great mistake. I thought they were built on higher taxes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a <laughs> well, that too. That's a great mistake too. <laughs> the great. The great mistake. Please. I understand with hydrogen how we're cleaned up here. How do we clean up our soil that we put in with fertilizers and all that? Junk? Well, here's the answer. I mean, it's a simple, straightforward answer. If we stop, if we stop accumulating anything that's dangerous, and, and it doesn't make any difference, it's PCBs, you, you, dioxin, you start naming what's terrible. I'll tell you that in given some relaxed time or some a holiday from it, the bugs will eat it. If, if we let it happen, if we just give a vacation to making dioxin, it disappears. The bugs eat it. The bugs adapt to eat it. Right. It's startling. Best, 
oil spill cleanup there was. It's Cal true. Well, it is true. You, you, you. They proved it. The best oil spill cleanup they've ever found is Calendar. And the reason. It's concentrated in feedlots there. It's true. They came up. They came up and hauled it out by the dang tons to take down the store at the Gulf of Mexico. And just have it for the next spill. Pressure. Cow dung. Cow manure. Yep. Cow manure. Pressure. They, they it's spent true. five years trying to produce the bug and found it out there in the, in the field. <laughs> so they come up and they hauled down hundreds of tons of it, stored it. And right bugs will eat the cattle for fertilizer so they could have it right there in case they had a bad Well, yeah. Yeah. okay, we're going to... Uh,